Uh, Director, I have one question regarding my opening comment, and I view it as a most important question, and I hope you will answer it. Why was it necessary to announce 11 days before a presidential election that you were opening an investigation on a new computer without any knowledge of what was in that computer? Why didn't you just do the investigation as you would normally? with no public announcement? Yeah, great question, Senator. Thank you. Um, October 27th, the investigative team that had finished the investigation in July, focused on Secretary Clinton's emails, asked to meet with me. So I met with them that morning, late morning, in my conference room, and they laid out for me what they could see from the metadata on this fellow Anthony Weiner's laptop that had been seized in an unrelated case. What they could see from the metadata was that there were thousands of Secretary Clinton's emails on that device, including what they thought might be the missing emails from her first three months as Secretary of State. We never found any emails from her first three months. She was using a Verizon Blackberry then, and that's obviously very important because it, if there was evidence that she was acting with bad intent, that's where it would be in the but first three months. But they weren't there. Look, can I just finish my answer, Senator? Yeah. And so they came in and said, we can see thousands of emails from the Clinton email domain, including many, many, many from the Verizon Clinton domain, BlackBerry domain. They said, we think we got to get a search warrant to go get these. And the Department of Justice agreed we had to go get a search warrant. So I agreed. I authorized them to seek a search warrant. And then I faced a choice. And I've lived my entire career by the tradition that if you can possibly avoid it, you avoid any action in the run-up to an election that might have an impact, whether it's a dog catcher election or President of the United States. But I sat there that morning, and I could not see a door labeled no action here. I could see two doors, and they were both actions. One was labeled speak, the other was labeled conceal. Because here's how I thought about it. I'm not trying to talk you into this, but I want you to know my thinking. Having repeatedly told this Congress, we are done and there's nothing there. There's no case there, there's no case there to restart in a hugely significant way, potentially finding the emails that would reflect on her intent from the beginning and not speak about it would require an act of concealment, in my view. And so I stared at speak and conceal. Speak would be really bad. There's an election in 11 days. Lordy, that would be really bad. Concealing, in my view, would be catastrophic, not just to the FBI, but well beyond. And honestly, as between really bad and catastrophic, I said to my team, we've got to walk into the world of really bad. I've got to tell Congress that we're restarting this, not in some frivolous way, in a hugely significant way. And the team also told me, we cannot finish this work before the election. And then they worked night after night after night, and they found thousands of new emails. They found classified information on Anthony Weiner. Somehow, her emails are being forwarded to Anthony Weiner, including classified information by her assistant, Huma Abedin. And so they found thousands of new emails and then called me the Saturday night before the election and said, thanks to the wizardry of our technology, we've only had to personally read 6,000. We think we can finish tomorrow morning, Sunday. And so I met with them. And they said, we found a lot of new stuff. We did not find anything that changes our view of her intent. So we're in the same place we were in July. It hasn't changed our view. And I asked them lots of questions. And I said, OK, if that's where you are, then I also have to tell Congress that we're done. Look, this was terrible. It makes me mildly nauseous to think that we might have had some impact on the election. But honestly, it wouldn't change the decision. Everybody who disagrees with me has to come back to October 28th with me and stare at this and tell me what you would do. Would you speak or would you conceal? And I could be wrong, but we honestly made a decision between those two choices that even in hindsight, and this has been one of the world's most painful experiences, I would make the same decision. I would not conceal that on October 28th from the Congress. And I sent the letter to Congress. By the way, people forget this. I didn't make a public announcement. I sent a private letter to the chairs and the rankings oh, of the wow. oversight committees. Did I know it's a distinction without a difference in the world of leaks, but it, is, it was very important that I tell them instead of concealing. And reasonable people can disagree, but that's the reason I made that choice. And it was a hard choice. I still believe in retrospect the right choice, as painful as this has been. And I'm sorry for the, the long answer. Well, let me respond. On the letter, it was just a matter of minutes before the world knew about it. Secondly, my understanding, and staff has just said to me, that you didn't get a search warrant before making the announcement. 
I think that's right. I think I authorized, and the Department of Justice agreed we were going to seek a search warrant. I actually don't see it as a meaningful distinction. Well, it's very, it, it's very hard. It would have been, you took an enormous gamble. The gamble was that there was something there that would invalidate uh, her candidacy, and there wasn't. So one has to look at that action and say, did it affect the campaign? And I think most people who have looked at this say, yes, it did affect the campaign. Why would he do it? And was there any conflict among your staff? People saying do it, people saying don't do it, as has been reported? No, it was a great debate. I have a fabulous staff at all levels. And one of my junior lawyers said, should you consider that what you're about to do may help elect Donald Trump president? And I said, thank you for raising that. Not for a moment. Because down that path lies the death of the FBI as an independent institution in America. I can't consider for a second whose political fortunes will be affected in what way. We have to ask ourselves, what is the right thing to do? and then do that thing. I'm very proud of the way we debated it, and at the end of the day, everyone on my team agreed we have to tell Congress that we are restarting this in a hugely significant way. Well, there's a way to do that. I don't know whether it would work or not, but certainly in a classified way, carrying out your tradition of not announcing uh, investigations. And, yep. you, you know, I look at this exactly the opposite way you do. Um, everybody knew it would influence the investigation before, that there was a very large uh, percentage of chance that it would. And yet that percentage of chance was taken, and there was no information, and the election was lost. So it seems to me that before uh, your department does something like this, you really ought to because it, Senator Leahy began to uh, talk about other, other investigations, and I think this theory does not hold up when you look at other investigations. But let me go on to um, 702, because uh, you began your comments saying how important it is, and yes, it is uh, important. Um, we've got, a, I think, a, a problem and um, the issue that we're going to need to address is the FBI's practice of searching 702 data using U.S. person identifiers as query terms. And some have called this an unconstitutional backdoor search, while others say that such queries are essential to assuring that potential terrorists don't slip through the cracks as they did before. So could you give us your views on that? and how it might be handled to avoid the charge, which may bring down 702. No, thank you, Senator. It's a really important issue. The way 702 works is, under that provision of the statute, the FISA court, federal judges, authorize us as U.S. agencies to collect the communications of non-U.S. people that we believe to be overseas if they're using American infrastructure. The criticism the FBI has gotten and the feedback we've gotten consistently since 9-11 is you have to make sure you're in a position to connect the dots. You can't have stovepiped information. And so we've responded to that over the last 10 years, mostly to the great work of my predecessor, Bob Mueller, and we have confederated databases so that if we collect information under 702, it doesn't sit in a separate stovepipe. It sits in a single cloud-type environment so that if I'm opening an investigation in the United States in a terrorism matter or an intelligence matter or a criminal matter, and I have a name of the suspect and their telephone number and their email addresses, I search the FBI's databases. That search necessarily will also touch the information that was collected under 702 so that we don't miss a dot. But nobody gets access to the information that sits in the 702 database unless they've been trained correctly. If there is, let's imagine that terrorists overseas were talking about a suspect in the United States or someone's email address in the United States was in touch with that terrorist. 
And that information sits in the 702 database. When we open the case in the United States and put in that name and that email address, it will touch that data and tell us there's information in the 702 database that's relevant. If the agent doing the query is properly trained on how to handle that, he or she will be able to see that information. If they're not properly trained, they'll be alerted that there is information. Then they have to go get the appropriate training and the appropriate oversight to be able to see it. But to do it otherwise is to risk us, where it matters most, in the United States, failing to connect dots. So my view is the information that's in the 702 database has been lawfully collected, carefully overseen and checked, and our use of it is also appropriate and carefully overseen and checked. So you are not masking the data? Unmasking the data? I'm not sure what that means in this context. What we do is we combine information collected from any lawful source in a single FBI database so we don't miss a dot when we're conducting investigations in the United States. What we make sure, though, is nobody gets to see FISA information of any kind unless they've had the appropriate training and have the appropriate oversight. My time is up. Thank you. Senator Hatch. Well, thank you, uh, Senator. Dr. Comey, in January, I introduced the uh, S-139.